I've been through probably four major real estate cycles. And what always seems to happen is costs start going up slowly and then they start going up faster. And at some point they kind of hang out at, I don't know, five or 6%. And then at some point rents can't keep pace with it and, you know, capital dries up and, and the market stalls and, and costs definitely come back down, but they never go back to where they were. Right. So, you know, the example I always give the same garden product we built now, I built the first one in Dallas in 2010 and our hard cost was 68 bucks a foot. That same product today is 142 bucks a foot to build. Two years ago, that product was 115, 120 bucks a foot to build. So I don't know that it's ever going to go back to 120, but I don't think it's going to be, it may not be 140 to 145. Maybe it's going to come back down to 130. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Powers, and I want to thank you for joining me on the Fort Podcast today. This show is an open-ended discussion and journey covering real estate, business, entrepreneurship, and investing. I would love to hear from you by tweeting me at Fort Worth Chris on Twitter. And if you've enjoyed this show, I would be super grateful if you would subscribe on Apple or Spotify or whatever platform you're listening on. And if on Apple, if you would leave a rating and review, it would mean a lot. And last but not least, you can check out all these episodes on YouTube. Hey guys, it's Chris. I'm super excited about today's episode with my friend Laird Sparks. Laird is the Senior Managing Director at Graystar here in DFW, running development and construction. Back when I was 22 or 23 years old, I assembled some land here in Fort Worth and I knew I could probably turn it into apartments or townhomes. And that's when I met Laird. Uh, Laird was working at Graystar and approached me to entitle the land and do a big multifamily development. And at that time in my career, um, I had done much smaller deals. I spent 18 months under contract with Graystar and learned all about entitlement and how the big companies think about things. And Laird and I became really good friends and have stayed good friends ever since. So today's episode is going to be awesome. Graystar is a behemoth. They have uh, 45 billion plus in assets under management. That is over 181,000 units and 114 global markets. But today we're going to talk about the work that they're primarily doing in Texas. That's Laird Experience. Uh, we'll be talking about conventional multifamily, age restricted adult living. We'll be talking about single family rental development. And we'll be talking a little bit about student housing and just kind of everything going on there. So, Thank you for continuing to join me on this journey, and I hope you enjoy. Laird, thank you for joining me today. Good, good to be here. Can't believe you have your own podcast. I know. All right, let's just start. Kind of what's been your story kind of growing up in Graystar and kind of how has Graystar evolved since you got there? Yeah, so I'm probably one of the few people. I started right out of college. So I graduated Texas Tech in 1998 and went to work from a, for a small property management company called Graystar. Started out in Houston, started on the property management side. Um, you know, I think at the time we had less than a thousand employees and really just got lucky that I was able to start with a company in its infancy. And so I really started on the management side, worked into the construction side and the development side, and you kind of got to work on all sides of the business and was in Houston for about five years. And then I moved to the corporate office in Charleston, was there about four, and then relocated to Dallas to go back into the development division. So you fast forward today, um, you know, we've got close to 20,000 employees and, you know, domestic offices, international offices. It's pr pretty, pretty crazy. The, the evolution that's happened in my 23 years I've been there. Was that always the plan to grow this massive company? Or are you consistently surprised at the challenges that y'all take on? Yeah. I mean, the, the owner of the company, Bob Faith, came from a development background at Crow Company and um, I think always wanted to have an evergreen business. He, you know, in good times and bad, he didn't want to have to ramp up for when the development wave was kicking in and then have to lay a bunch of people off. So he just really started off wanting to grow the management company to, you know, the biggest and the best. And then, you know, really organic growth from there uh, on the development and the acquisition business. I don't know that anybody could have predicted 23 years ago that we would have the scale that we do today. Um, but 
it nothing surprises me anymore. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, I can't predict anymore. Can you speak to just at a high level kind of the structure of how Graystar operates, meaning uh, I know corporate's in Charleston and then there's regions you and then we can chat about what your region, uh, what you uh, do here. But how's the company kind of set up at the highest level? Yeah, so it's it's I always tell everybody it's kind of a three legged stool. So there's the property management division, okay. which the leader of that business is in Tampa, Florida. OK, the development and construction business, which is the one I'm in, um, that leader is in Charleston, South Carolina. And then we have the investment um, platform which goes out and buys existing deals. And that's really the fundraising part of the business. Um, you know, they're headquartered out of Charleston. And so the three leaders of those businesses report into Bob Faith, who owns Graystar. And then there's regions all over the country, yeah, all so, over the world. So the management, yeah. So the, there's 35 kind of domestic offices, but we're really organized into, in a West division, central and East. So each of the three business lines have a, you know, kind of a West central and East kind of leader. Okay. And then what does your office do and what do you uh, manage now? Yeah. So um, our, our territory, we cover Mexico and then we, we basically have um, a part of the central U S. So we're, we're kind of North Texas all the way up to Canada, kind of through the Great Plains. Primarily our, over the last several years, we've really just been in DFW. It's been such a big market, but I see us probably doing something one day and you know, Oklahoma City and maybe some student deals, you know, throughout yeah. Nebraska or, you know, the other big 12 schools. And most of what you're doing is all development construction. You're not doing any uh, of the investing, buying existing? Our division, that would be the investment arm. Yeah, we just we just source the land and, and go vertical. Okay, so talking about development, you've now been doing it, what, 12, 13 years, 14 years? I know this is kind of a big question. But is there anything that comes to mind if I said, like, what has changed about development in 14 years, whether it's the complexity to get deals done? Like, what are some of the big things that you've seen kind of change over your career? Cap rates. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I underwrote my first development deal in Houston, Texas, you had to be an untrended deal to nine and a half. Today, you're sub six. Um, so just the sheer amount of capital that's come into the space. And then no question, the 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 buildings have, on the one hand, they stayed simple, but they've gotten more complex from, I mean, in the, in the 90s, nobody focused on waterproofing details. Nobody focused on technology. You didn't even think about cold storage. So I think you fast forward today, what makes the building complicated is you're not only trying to meet the needs of the renter today, but you're trying to guess what they're going to be 10 years from now. I mean, the, the running joke in the apartment industry is, you know, don't build a dumb building. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's really, really, really hard to do with as fast as technology's, you know, changing. Mean, we've got some high rises in certain parts of the country where they're, they, they do Amazon, a, a drone lands on top of the building and your package goes down an elevator. And, you know, we used to five years ago, you would try to oversize your leasing office to store packages. Well, now everybody's having groceries delivered. So, um, you know, in the pandemic, everybody was working from home. So internet was, you know, and bandwidth was hugely important and security is important. And you're constantly having to try to find a way to drive your costs down, um, you know, to keep your rents, um, you know, in a manageable, you know, level. So technology, I think, um, and, and then just the sheer demand coming into the space and what that's done to, to cap rates and, you know, the price of land and, and stuff like that. We'll get into it kind of later on amenities, but is there anything that we have learned that, you know, used to be in every apartment complex, like a gym that nobody really, you know, like a small gym and a pool. Like, are there things that are becoming obsolete that don't matter anymore or maybe from an amenity side or things that used to be around when you first started that you wouldn't even consider putting in a building today? I don't know if anything, one thing jumps out. I mean, um, I think everything can be a little bit smaller. I yeah. mean, you know, you used to build a 10 or 11,000 square foot clubhouse and now 6,000 seems to be fine. You know, obviously if you built seven or 800 units, but just generally speaking, you, you just need a moderately sized gym and a moderately sized pool. And, um, you know, the customer really cares about the features in their home and, you know, where do I park my car and how far do I have to walk? But, you know, security is a big deal and, yeah. and just technology, you know, does, do I, why do I need a key? Can't my phone open it up? And, and, and so, um, Te technology's just been the biggest driver, I think, in in our business. Is it fair to say, kind of 
uh, throughout this cycle, you kind of primarily started in the core doing kind of core deals or were you still kind of doing them all over? Yeah. I mean, I, I moved to Dallas in 2007 and the first three or four years after we got through the, the GFC crisis, it was all kind of infill. And then seemed like in 2012 or 13, a couple of years after I met you, everybody went to a ULI conference in San Diego and came back and suddenly everybody was looking in town. And so we went to the suburbs for a little bit, but yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I would say over the last five years, we have mainly been focused, um, in town, uh, the last couple and really, um, you know, currently we're only looking really in, in the suburbs, not looking for the higher basis, higher rent, you know, deals in town. Um, it's, it's kind of a tough market right now. Are you in secondary and tertiary markets or you'll look at kind of anything? We're in, we're in both primarily, um, DFW is obviously a tier one market, but I mean, we've talked, I mean, we're, we're all the way out in Hudson Oaks and Weatherford and we've looked all the way out in Prosper and Salina and, you know, I I was in Midlothian the other day. I mean, so we've definitely expanded from the Plano's and the the Frisco's and the, and the McKinney's to um, where the city's growing, which is out. Is that where, is everybody now doing that too? Now everybody's jumping to suburban tertiary uh, or are, this, are there still some folks staying only fo- focused in the core? I think there's some only focused in the core, but it's only a handful. You know, primarily you're kind of bread and butter high rise developers, but um, there's a lot of competition in the in the suburban areas. Um, you know, there, there's there's not a lack of competition for for land today, just about just about anywhere. But I would say it's the last couple of years in the pandemic, the the suburban stuff has definitely performed much, much better than the, the infill, infill stuff. From an entitlement perspective, where you think about like, you know, farmland and kind of these emerging, especially in DFW, I mean, you take Frisco, it was nothing 15 years ago. Now it's a bustling place. Are entitlements in suburban markets tougher? Like, are they harder to get? Are they, are these cities already kind of planned out so you know where to go? You know, I'll, I'll just dance. I'll, I'll take the kind of chicken way. I think it just depends. I mean, I can think of five or six deals we're working on now and, you know, in a couple of them, the, the, the towns are pretty much in agreement with how we see the product and, and, and what the market needs are. And in a, in another couple of cases, they, now they want, you know, they want, give me retail with apartments above it and, and, and some mix. So the suburban stuff is still difficult from an entitlement standpoint, I can't say it's as difficult as, as infill, but it's still difficult. A lot of the cities definitely still have their own vision for what they think should go there. And that can be different from what the market wants. Um, and then just since the pandemic started, I mean, the cities are short staffed. Yeah. I mean, you've got other cities stealing people. And so permitting takes, I mean, our, from the time we put a track on a uh, land under contract, you know, you're, you're probably 12 months before you can get a shovel in the ground. And that that's if everything goes relatively smooth with the zoning case and relatively smooth with the, the building permit process. But I mean, there's multiple tracts of land where we've closed on land and I thought we were going to start construction and we got six months of delays because we couldn't get our permits. Yep. Can you speak any to the differences between like an urban uh, facility versus a suburban, like are units bigger? Is it flat parking instead of structured, you know, more families in the suburban areas than in the core? Like what are the main differences in what you're building? Yeah. So I'd say in the urban core, you're probably going to be more like 80, 90% one bedrooms, yeah. 10, 20% two bedrooms. Maybe your average unit size infill is going to be anywhere from 750 to 850, just really a, a manageable chunk rent. Um, as you go into more of a suburban community, you're probably going to be more 60% ones, um, 40% twos, and your average unit size is probably going to be more like 900 to 1,000 yep. square feet. In terms of the amenities, I mean, obviously the 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 infill stuff, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be in a in, in some type of structured parking um, garage. The suburban is going to be definitely going to be surface, um, you know, parked in. The suburban stuff is just going to have, you know, a little bit more air. You're going to probably have some pet yards on the first floor. You're going to have a big dog park, probably some walking trails as in, in the infill stuff. You know, you're going to have to kind of manufacture your own amenities either on top of the parking garage or, 
you know, somewhere on the, on the perimeter of the building, but it's pretty, you know, pretty tight site. Are y'all doing any, you know, it's been labeled now workforce housing or kind of more of affordable housing, or is it still kind of class A suburban stuff? It's, it's everything. I mean, we're, we're definitely doing, um, you know, the way I, the way I think about it, I'm not sure what the technical definition, but the way I define workforce, I mean, I think the, the government, the, the housing urban development defines, um, you know, a renter shouldn't spend more than a third of their income toward rent. And so when I look at market rate housing in the suburbs, you know, that's rents that are achievable for people that make a hundred percent of the median income where no more than a third of their um, income goes to rent. Attainable, I think, is the same thing, except it's 80% of median income. And then what I consider workforce is 60% of median income. So I would, I think today we're playing more in the market rate and attainable range. I mean, to really get to true workforce, I think it usually involves a, a tax credit or, you know, some some other type of, of financially engineered solution to, yeah. to make your economics work. Well, like the the big talk, and it, we've we've chatted about it a bunch. The whole country is talking about it. Is the cost to build and the cost to live just keeps going up and up. Um, there really hasn't been a silver bullet of how to build stuff cheaper. You work at the large or one of the largest development companies in the world. Like, is there anything on the horizon that gets you excited that like we could start building units for half the cost, maybe prefab or shipping container? I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess here's what I would say. Um, so locally, I, I think on over the past two to three years, we've seen costs, hard costs growing at about 5% a year. Land is dip. I mean, all you, you're a landowner, all you landowners think the price of land just goes up forever, but hard <laughs> costs have definitely been going up about 5% a year. Obviously about 12 months ago, I mean, lumber per board foot was 15, 1600 a board foot. Yeah. Um, it's dropped down to about seven or 800 now, but we definitely, when we were closing on deals six, nine months ago, we were definitely have significant, you know, budget problems. Yep. Um, we accepted the cost increase and, um, you know, accepted a lower going in, um, yield and we just dropped our exit cap a little bit and kind of felt like that's probably how it would, would turn out. And so far that's, that's played itself out. Um, I don't, what always seems to happen, and I've, I've been through probably four major real estate cycles, and what always seems to happen is costs start going up slowly, and then they start going up faster. And at some point, they kind of hang out at, I don't know, 5 or 6%. And then at some point, rents can't keep pace with it, and you know, capital dries up and, and, and the market stalls. And, and costs definitely come back down, but they never go back to where they were. Right. So- you know, the example I always give the, the same garden product we built now, I built the first one in Dallas in 2010 and our hard cost was 68 bucks a foot. That same product today is 142 bucks a foot to build. Two years ago, that product was 115, 120 bucks a foot to build. So I don't know that it's ever going to go back to 120, but I don't think it's going to be, it may not be 100. 40 to 145, maybe it's going to come back down to 130. Um, in, in terms of alternate building, um, we've done modular. Uh, so in, in Europe, um, modular is a big deal. Yeah. Um, in the Texas markets in the short term, it's compared to other markets like San Francisco or New York, it's relatively cost effective to build here. So I'm not sure in the short term if you'll see modular catch wave in the apartments. Um, we actually own a modular, we bought a modular, um, plant in, on the East coast. And we're actually, we're actually set up to do modular units. And I think we'll probably do some on, on the higher price coastal markets. We're also doing kind of bathroom pods. So I mean, maybe, maybe we'd look at some of the Texas stuff at maybe having kind of a portion of the unit being modular, but for the foreseeable future, I just, I don't know that in DFW, the Texas metros, you'll see a lot of it. Yeah. Um, because it's all already relatively cost effective to build. What makes up the bulk of that price increase? Is it just a little bit of everything or is it labor frame or uh, lumber concrete? Like are there major drivers of the cost increase or is it kind of everything's going up 6%? It, 
Yeah, I'm sure there's some primary drivers. I mean, our construction guys are probably a little closer to me, but I mean, I, on our on our wood frame stuff, it's definitely been lumber. It's definitely been labor. Um, anything with concrete or steel, um, anything with kind of oil or, or petrochemical products. Those, but but lumber, far lumber, concrete, and steel are are kind of the three big, um, the the big drivers, and and definitely, definitely labor has has um, has definitely moved up. Is that a is that a a COVID thing or is that a there's so much demand for housing that we're just building so much of it that labor can't keep up or is it a combination of both or is do Americans just not don't want to do kind of blue collar labor anymore? You know, it I'm sure it's a confluence of, of events. I mean, it it was happening before COVID hit. I yeah. mean, I think it probably goes back to 2008 2009 when we all went through the last major financial crisis, a lot of that, that labor force, it left the country and, and it, it didn't come back (laughs) and it it hasn't been able to come back with, you know, because of tougher laws. So, I mean, I just think generally speaking, um, there's just not enough workers to, 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 you know, work on everything that all these major, um, commercial developers, whether it's industrial or apartments or, um, you know, retail office, whatever road projects, um, there's just probably a supply demand imbalance. Going into COVID, and maybe this is just from my seat, you might think differently, but kind of the narrative was like rents are starting to get, I don't know, felt they were higher than ever. They were kind of topping out in some markets. Uh, COVID happened. And now you pick up any real estate journal, it's like rents are going up 10 to 20% in some markets going crazy. What's driving that? I know it's supply demand to some degree, but why the the massive jump so quickly during COVID? Again, I don't know if every single market has experienced that, but um, the suburban markets have definitely seen. I mean, I, I would say pre-COVID, a suburban deal we would underwrite at an absorption of twenty to twenty-five units a month. Yeah, um, and when we all started this. COVID and pandemic, I mean, we were, we didn't know what was going to happen, but pretty quickly we found out that, that there was more demand for certain suburban locations, maybe than others. And, and we just got a little bit lucky in the stuff that was leasing up. We definitely, we definitely well outpaced the 20 to 25 a month. It was, it was probably more like, you know, 35 to 40 units a month. And was that people just moving out of the core because they wanted to be in more of a, you know, spread out area or? I I think, again, I I know I keep saying a confluence of events, but I think that was part of it. I think you had what every major college campus was (laughs) um, not back to school and people were home more. Some people were getting apartments. I mean, you had people, the the home market's been wild hot. People are selling their homes and thinking they're getting out at the top. So I just think it was there was probably eight or 10 major demand factors that happened. And a lot of people were moving to Texas. Um, I mean, there's so many people that we see coming through our doors that, um, I mean, in in the sub suburban community I live in as a native Texan of every 10 people I meet, only one's a native Texan. And there, a lot of people come from California, the Midwest, Florida. So with the job growth that we've all been lucky and fortunate enough to experience in DFW, I just think you've had a ton of people over the past 24 months that continue to relocate to the Metro area. I think in the short term, a lot of people have gravitated more toward the suburban communities, but you're starting to definitely see demand pick back up in the, in the infill markets as the big employers start, you know, welcoming the, the young, the, the young guns kind of back to the office and, and, you know, people are now back in college and graduating and moving on down the line. So we're like, I, I'm pretty sure everything I read DFW is like leading the way in new apartment development right now. Maybe it's a long-term question, but are we really anywhere close to like meeting demand right now? Or could we just keep, is the horizon kind of indefinite for now? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think if you look at DFW from a macro standpoint, whether you're talking about the rental side of the equation or the for sale side, just from a macro level, I don't, I don't think we're meeting the demand, but there are pockets where there's probably too much supply. Um, but overall, um, we're probably not meeting the, the demand, but there's, there's pockets to be cautious on. 
How much do um, property taxes impact deals right now? And property taxes, I know in our portfolio, just seem to like double every year. I mean, it's your largest expense item. Yeah. The um, government's your partner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, it, it, it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a big deal. I mean, w when you have a buyer, I mean, the difference between them underwriting taxes on the, on the price they're paying at 85% or 95% is massive. You know, generally speaking so far, um, there's a pretty health, healthy appetite for, for the new product. And so, um, I, I mean, if a buyer sees a deal that they want to buy, they know they're probably going to have to be more aggressive than they would like in a perfect world with their tax assumption. But I think generally speaking, what I'm hearing from most of the brokers in the community are, I bet most people on average are underwriting taxes at 90%. Yeah. I mean, some are probably below that. Some are probably higher than that. But I mean, I think five years ago, the average was probably 80 to 85%. My favorite is when I tell you about a deal that's going on and you're, you'll look at me and you're like, that isn't going to work. Like, I know it's not going to work. And generally you're right. But a lot of people come in with more optimistic underwriting. You've been here a long time. You said you've been through three or four cycles. Is there anything different about this cycle besides interest rates keep dropping and there's been COVID and things like that, but that are different from the first three or four cycles? Man, I, I think they've all been different. I mean... I mean, the pandemic started, right? And we all, it, it's it's been a very different cycle in the sense that it hasn't affected everybody the same. I mean, I think back in 2008, nine, I mean, everybody got crushed. Here in this cycle, it, it seems like, you know, definitely the, it just hasn't been as equal. I mean, there, you know, there's been certain aspects of, of jobs that have gotten hit harder than others. I mean, obviously the re the retail industry has been in hard. The restaurant industry has been hit hard, the, you know, Uber. Uh, and the, I mean, so, you know, a, a lot of people, surprisingly, um, as we all went into pandemic, it was amazing. I think everybody's kind of figured out, man, you can, you can kind of work from home and, and work remotely and, and be successful. And maybe we don't have to travel this much. And so, um, I don't know, it's just, I think a pandemic is just totally different than, um, a, a financial crisis where nobody can borrow money. I mean, you, you've still been able to borrow money now early in the, early in the pandemic, there was definitely a lot of, you know, people being cautious, including us trying to kind of, and then you get three or four months into it and you kind of start to, you know, figure it out. And there's definitely been, you know, starts and stops, but, um, it, it just hasn't been driven by the total meltdown and dr dry up of, of access to capital. People have still been able to access capital. And then I think the demand certainly for apartments has, has probably been more than a lot of us thought, you know, 18 months ago. Yeah. Is there anything you're re you're doing? And I know we're going to talk about a couple other product types, but because of COVID that will kind of permanently change the way you lay out floor plans, like having home offices or ventilation of air or there any kind of tweaks y'all are making in response to it? I think most. I mean, I, certainly if you have a, a a type one or high rise type building, um, maybe that would you'd have some different considerations than you would have on a on a kind of more garden suburban deal. But generally speaking, I would think I think the the biggest is probably just around uh, how you operate the properties. Yeah. I mean, I think going forward, we'll probably have a lot more. Um, virtual leasing. We'll probably have a lot more, um, you know, maybe less staff in the office and, and, you know, more people allowed to go to our unit on their own. Um, certainly attention to detail on how you're cleaning units and, and how you're providing maintenance services and how you're communicating with people. So to me, I think most of it may not necessarily be the way the building is designed, but how you think about how to manage it and operate in it and, and meet all the customers, um, needs in a similar fashion to, to how we've met them over the past couple of years. I just don't know that anybody's going to want to go back to the way it, the way it was. Yeah. All right. The last couple of years, we, we almost worked on a deal, but a lot of our conversations you've been working on kind of the emergence of single family rental. I guess there was another ULI convention that everybody went to a couple of years ago. Cause now like literally everybody's seems to be doing it. 
uh, let's just start with um, kind of why is it so popular and uh, why is every yeah why is everybody getting into it? I look at single family rental as as kind of a broad term. Some people call it build to rent. The way I organize my thoughts around it are would be I would call it there's there's one design which would be I would call it a horizontal apartment. So okay. it's kind of a detached one or two, three or three bedroom unit, very much similar to what you'd see in a three story garden deal, but it's organized in a one story or two story detached fashion. The parking's all surface parked and it's either open parking, maybe it's a carport, maybe it's a detached garage. And there's a lot of people doing that and they're they're very, very successful. And that product, you know, does have a good size yard. And and so I think what's people are willing to pay a premium for that type of product over say a three-story garden. They don't have to walk up and down stairs. Um, they get a, a big private yard. Um, there's no shared kind of common walls. It just, it feels more like a, a boutique kind of, you know, bungalow. Yeah. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I think is, is, um, what I would call my definition of single family rental, which would be primarily three bedroom, homes of, of one and two stories, anywhere from 1,250 square feet to 1,850 square feet, and maybe some four bedrooms, maybe some, you know, two bedrooms. And so we, we, we were fortunate several years ago to start researching the space and our management um, team was fortunate enough to be chosen to lease up a few of these projects. And so that was our kind of first array into the space. We're now starting to, to work on the development a couple of fashions. We actually have a, in a couple of scenarios, we're partnering with folks that are much more experienced um, on the design and layout of, of kind of more like a for sale community. Ours is, but ours is rental. So I see us probably partnering maybe with some folks on the first fuse, you know, before we try to dip our toe in the water and, 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 and do it by ourselves. But we're rapidly kind of much like we researched the senior housing space with with one of our partners where we've been researching the space now for probably a good 12 months. And, um, but on, on those we're right now we're partnering with, um, the home builders. We're not, we're not performing, um, GC services like we do on most of our stuff. Um, so we're, we're partnering with, with, you know, five or six of the big home builders. And, and then in some cases we'll work with a, with a co-development partner. So. So when you say you're work you're working with them, like y'all will find the land, finance the project, and just hire them as kind of a fee contractor to build it. That's certainly one option. Another option may be, um, you know, they might they might find the land, and we might be the equity. Um, you know, and a, another option would be um, we find the land and bring them in as a as a fee developer. Um, it just kind of depends on the situation. We we've, we've got a little bit of everything going on right now. Are the units like the material on the interior kind of comparable to a class A apartment, like same kind of finish outs? Exactly what it, what it's like. And it, maybe you're not doing them, but is is there anybody doing like luxury single family rentals where it might be a four bedroom, 3000 square foot house or like much bigger and nicer finish outs? I haven't heard much of that. Yeah. Um, maybe an infiller. I mean. I guess we kind of have one like that in town. It's, it's 180 units. Um, it's one, two, three, and four bedroom townhomes. And we have 12 single family homes and the single family homes in that particular location, they're about 2,500 square feet. But again, that was a very site specific. Um, but generally speaking, I think that, um, most folks are trying to give a customer what they want in a good size home, but also keep the, you know, the, the rent check, you know, probably below 3000 bucks a month and not, not bump up too much, um, to compete with the single family homes. And are all these being done on one big plat or are they individually platting lots in the event this could ever be a for sale product? Does anybody even think about it that way? It's happened in both ways. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how to put a percentage on it, but I mean, I, maybe half of them are being built on, on one lot. Um, if you, uh, under that scenario, if you wanted to convert it to for sale, you would just go through a, a condo, um, process. There's certainly plenty doing them on individually platted lots, which would certainly open up that optionality, you know, more, but 
both have pros and cons. I mean, from a, from a municipal fee standpoint, the individually platted route is generally going to, you're going to have a lot higher impact fees. Yeah. Most cities are going to make you individually meter the homes. Whereas if you go the one lot route, um, they'll look at it more like a, an apartment and let you do a couple meters. And then from a tax perspective, I think the jury's still out um, on which ones, um, you know, one school of thought is the individ- the single platted lot, the appraiser, appraisal district may look at it more like a um, the way they view apartments. And on individually platted, they may look at it more like um, how they do for sale homes. So the jury's still kind of out on. But generally speaking, I think my philosophy is it's just a lot simpler and easier just to go the one lot route. If there's some compelling reasons um, why or if a city is really really would prefer it a different way, then then we'd be open to it. And then as far as like the demographic of tenant, is it more kind of older folks and families? And are they usually staying longer uh, if they're in a single family rental or kind of the you same? Know, I, don't, I don't know that we have a big enough sample size. I mean, we've not even, we like I said, we've leased some of these up for other owners, but we've not built one yet but i mean i think generally speaking the average age is is a little is 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 older um and you know there's probably are some more families but i i don't know that we have a big enough sampling size um other than to know that the average age is a little bit older yeah if you had 300 homes and 300 apartments is there anything different in the lease up like different way to sell it or yeah 300 homes would probably be pretty big i mean i think most of the deals that we would look at would probably be in the 150 to 250 unit range. So the 300 unit apartment deal, like I said, is probably going to lease up at 25 to 30 units a month. And the, you know, the 150 to 250 single family rental deal, you know, it's probably going to lease up between 10 to 15 a month. Yeah. Our capital markets, they're hot. There's a lot of equity out there. Debts at, you know, historic lows. Are capital markets treating either product type differently or it's all kind of looked at there's demand for both? You know, I think the the two the two types that are most in demand are the single family rental B2R stuff and the the attainable housing. I mean, I think a lot of the capital providers feel like, okay, we you know, we've we've done a lot of the infill and suburban kind of luxury product and Maybe we just need to consider just kind of doing a more attainable product. You know, you know, most of the suburban stuff, I mean, you know, instead of trying to get, you know, sixteen to seventeen hundred dollar rents, maybe maybe you should try more thirteen fifty to fourteen hundred on average. Yeah. Just it's just a much wider demand pool and where they're a, not much of that had been built over the past four or five years. A lot of it had been, you know, driven by what we were talking about earlier, I mean, cities wanting a, a, a product where you had to make the economics work. You had to, to, to convince yourself you could get sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars $1,700 rents. And I think what, what, when we go back five, six years ago and on the stuff we underwrote, I think we generally got our going in rents, right. But we overestimated the rent growth. Right. And then we, but we also overestimated exit caps. So I think, I think now we're just trying to say, let's be realistic. Um, about where our starting rents are. Let's be more conservative on how we're growing the rents. And we probably need to be less conservative on our exit cap rates. And that's probably how the deal is going to shake out. Has there been any change um, from a perspective of, you know, you're traditionally a merchant developer, build it, lease it, sell it. Is there more talk about let's build it, lease it, refinance it, hold it? Um, I mean, I think it, I think, we we still do both. I think yeah. it just it depends on who the capital is that's attracted to that deal. I mean, I you know I still think two thirds of our capital today is merchant build capital, and and there's certainly a portion of it that is that has a more long term view. I think the longer term view kind of build to core capital over the past several years has been more interested in the what they felt like was a higher barrier to entry infill market, be it a wrap or podium or high rise. But after watching the performance of, you know, the higher basis, higher rent deals in comparison to the lower basis, lower rent 
suburban deals, I, I think I could see a shift happening where, um, more of the build decor capital may be interested in, in looking at some more kind of garden stuff out. But I think for the, for the short term, most of our portfolio will still probably be a merchant build mentality, but we do have some that that's in longer term funds. Um, but we identify that on the outset. Let's take a quick break to highlight this episode's sponsor, Juniper Square. If you aren't familiar with Juniper Square, it's an easy to use all-in-one investment management software designed specifically for real estate owners. We have been using it at Fort Capital for several years now, and it has completely revamped the experience we're able to provide our investors through reporting, management, and efficiency. Here's a bit more on how Fort Capital utilizes the platform. You know, your, your, your tenants are your customers, but your real customers are your investors. And the real estate business, the lifeblood is the ability to have capital. It's an expensive game and being able to treat them, um, you know, like royalty. And when you have a lack of resources or you're smaller, it's very tough to be able to report in a way that, again, those high net worth individuals are expect are used to seeing. And so for years, we had either tried building stuff from scratch it never worked we would try hiring these companies that that wanted to charge us a quarter million dollars a year for investor reporting and it just never worked and when we found juniper um, it aligned with our mission to provide our investors not only great returns but a great experience in achieving those returns which goes back to transparency communication their ability to know where their money is you can check out episode 37 to listen to my full conversation with Brandon or visit cjunipersquare.com for more information. That's S-E-E junipersquare.com. And now back to the show. All right, let's talk about it. Uh, age restricted for a bit. That's the last deal we worked on. I learned about it a little bit. Like, how do you define it? I know it's over 55, but it's not quite like, how do you define uh, age restricted? And what is all the data shown y'all? Yeah, so. Um, I, I still don't know that we have it figured out. I mean, we're, we're kind of five years into it and we seem to, to learn new stuff, but let's just go back to the beginning. And by the way, everybody thinks they're a senior housing developer today, just like they do an SFR developer. I mean, it, it, but our premise, you know, several years ago, um, was the only choice a person 55 or older had at the time was they had to go into what's called an independent living facility, or they could stay in conventional apartments, market rate apartments. And what we found out and thought was that, you know, a lot of people don't that are 55 or older, they don't want to go live in a conventional apartment deal where the average age is 24, 25. But at the same time, they don't, they don't want to go pay five, six, seven thousand dollars a month to live in independent living and have to pay for three meals a day and housekeeping and linens. And so what we tried to do was deliver a, a product in the middle, which was an age restricted conventional apartment with services to cater toward an older demographic, you know, so, you know, early on, I would say that your, your demographic might be 30% of the, of, of the people still, um, worked, um, 60% of the people may be widowed. Um, and so what it became was how do you, I always kind of say, it's like going back to college and joining a fraternity or sorority or club, but you're not dead broke. You've got some walking around money you, right. you can. And so how do you bring these people together and create a social environment? And you do it, you do it with happy hours. You do it with, um, you know, kind of our activities director kind of, kind of creating, you know, monthly, um, you know, excursions, whether it's, you know, the Perot Center or whether it's the opera or, you know, maybe it's a college football game. I mean, so you just try And then what happens is as the project leases up, the environment kind of takes on its own life and you're just kind of there to, to be the guiding light. And, you know, you, you have the water aerobics classes on Wednesday and book clubs on, and you're, you're just there to try to, to kind of guide it. And so, um, I think the biggest thing we learned on the senior side is similar to what we were talking about earlier. Um, I think early on when we did our first, you know, several senior deals, um, we probably overshot the product and overshot the rent. And what the customer really wanted is something that's really, really nice, but I don't need it quite that nice. I don't need quite that level of service. 
but I want I want less rent. And right. so I think what you'll see us doing going forward is we'll still continue to do senior, but we'll really probably try to be a little bit more mindful of of that rent check, um, you know, for folks that are on more of a fixed income budget than than others. But it's been, um, you know, we we've done now close to fifty of these deals across the U.S. and um, we've had some that have been really really good, and there's been some that we were we just weren't right about. But right. one kind of guiding light has been um, the lower the rent check, the faster they lease up. Yep. Um, and everybody, once they live there, they absolutely love it. They love it. It's literally like living with a bunch of friends they haven't seen in 20 years. Yep. And, you know, my mom is, mom is 74. She lives in a 3000 square foot house in, in Keller. She could sell it for two X what she bought it for. My dad passed away a couple of years ago and she always talks about how lon- lonely she is. And I was like, well, mom, you know, we can liquidate the house yeah. and you can go 10 minutes away and live in one of these deals. And I think you might be surprised you'd have the time of your life. Yeah. So um, that's kind of what we've learned and what we're up to. Well, there's a lot of people turning 50. This is the the generation um, on, on all those amenities. Do they have like a charge card, like a country club, or it's just like baked into rent and you can do all those some, things? Some of them have kind of like a sundry shop or something like that. But I mean, we talk about 55 and older. I mean, the average age of our average deal, um, it, it's, it's much higher than 55. Yeah. So, I mean. All right. Let's just touch just a second on student. I know you don't do as much student more just from like the pandemic side. Well, we, we do a fair amount of students, just our geographic. Yeah. Region, your region. But, um, so I think we're the second largest owner of student housing in the, in the country and definitely of all the property types, um, the, the student got hit really, really hard. Um, um, we're, we started in the last year ramping up. We've got a couple new projects going to university of Texas. I think we've got one at Auburn, one at Mississippi state. So you're definitely a bunch, a bunch in California. You're, you're the, the pandemic hit and I mean, full on panic mode went in. I mean, in terms of, at least our on-campus, we, we have a lot of on-campus houses where we'll, we partner with the school itself. And so certainly the on-campus market got hit really, really hard. And, and right behind that was the off-campus market. But, um, you know, now that we've, everybody's kind of got their legs under them, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and we're, we're definitely doing student again. We're just not doing it um, as much locally in our region um, for some just kind of micro supply demand fundamentals. But we're, we're definitely, as a company, doing it just you know, more kind of in the Southeast and, you know, cause of some of the coastal markets. Yeah. yeah. Well, like there was no PPP for students. No. I know you talked about like on campus. Was there like a trend in the off campus students being like, you know, I want to unsign my lease or was there any like relief where college is doing anything kind of case by case or it was like, Hey, you have a lease. You might not live here this year, but like, that's what it is. You know, I probably should know the answer to that, but yeah. I, I just, I, I haven't been that close or as close as I probably should have been to the, the on-campus and off-campus world. I mean, definitely there has been a lot of communication with the, the universities themselves on, hey, what, what's Graystar's opinion, how we should handle this or that. And luckily with our operating platform as, as wide as it is, we, we were learning things real t- time on the conventional side. But um, it's definitely been fluid. You've definitely had to think outside the box. Um but I, I'm, I probably can't answer all yeah. the, the questions as well as I should be able to on, on, on that. I don't, then I'll ask one more. You may, may know, it may not. Are capital markets treating student housing, not just from COVID, but on one end, like on the active adult and senior, there's more seniors than ever. On the other end of college, there's like less people going to college. They're, you know, people are learning stuff on YouTube or they're going to virtual school or they're, is there anything like on the horizon that student housing might be shrinking or is there any talk about that? I haven't heard a lot about it. I mean, here's how I would say the, on the scale of what we've talked about today, the senior is the hardest to capitalize. Okay. There's not that many equity partners out there that are really playing in that space. The next hardest to capitalize, I would say would be student. Not that it's hard, but I'm just saying it's, yeah. there's, there's more players in student definitely than senior and then the most plentiful obviously are 
conventional SFR. Why are so many, why is there such less demand in senior? I would have thought it would be higher than ever. Is it because of risk or? I just think it's the product type we're doing is relatively new. It's relatively unproven. Yeah. Um, and so I just think that a lot of the big institutional partners are just kind of taking a little bit of a wait and see approach. I mean, are, are they really going to get the rents that they're underwriting? Yeah. I mean, are they really going to fill these things up or, or would people rather just, you know, age in place and, and bring, you know, folks to their home? Or are they just going to go to, to independent living? So it's definitely now that we've starting to stabilize a lot of these deals, we, we sold a couple of them. You're, you're seeing more and more capital come in, but I mean, Chris, if, if we're going to capitalize a senior deal, I can only think of two or three capital partners that, that, that we have that would consider doing it as where you go to conventional. And I mean, it's, it, it's almost unlimited. You may not know this, uh, cause y'all don't do it, but would there be more capital providers for like independent living and memory care, more of a proven model? I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. So it's that kind of middle ground. And there's right REITs, there's REITs that do that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Over the last five years, this has become my favorite topic. Um, you called me like a year or two ago and said, uh, I think we're going to start doing industrial. Y'all, anytime I think about Graystar, I think about units where people sleep. Industrial is a step out from that. So just kind of high level, what was obviously it's hot, but what are the thoughts there? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the two main principles of Graystar kind of came up through the, I mean, like a lot of successful real estate folks came up through the Crow organization and they started in the industrial space. And so I think that as a company, we had been, I had been hearing over the last four or five years talking about industrial, but you know, we were busy here, we we're busy there. We didn't have the the knowledge base. And then, you know, lo and behold, the pandemic hit and, you know, retail got kind of scary kind of quick and office got kind of scary kind of quick. And, you know, what seemed to be the most interest to capital was, um, you know, meds and beds. I mean, everybody gravitated toward industrial and, okay, where are we going to store everything? And logistics was becoming a big deal and Amazon, you know, kept getting bigger. And and so I think through, through one strategic kind of merger acquisition with a group that, that had done industrial for 30 years and had, had raised money around it, coming together with our, with, with our platform, um, it, it just, it just made sense. I mean, to a certain extent, um, building an industrial building is much easier than building a wood frame. I mean, there's nothing, in my opinion, harder than building a, a podium deal, which is, you know, a garage on the ground and wood frame above it. That, that's much harder than a high rise. I mean, a high rise, once you get up above the first couple of floors, it's just that everything repeats. Um, you know, an industrial deal, clearly what's hard for us is um, we don't have a lot of experience in it. So we got to make sure we don't, you know, pay a lot of dumb tax, um, but we've got knowledge on our side that we're comfortable that's not going to happen yeah. and we've convinced our you know capital um that that's not going to happen and so then it's just it's very it's a very simplistic you know building so as long as you have the intellectual capital how to build the right building and the right product and the right depth and all that it's much easier to actually develop what's on the paper than a, a, a dense wood frame apartment deal are y'all building obviously it's all new stuff but are you building like different sizes or are you tr going after the million square foot Amazon deals or more kind of the smaller stuff? Or? No, I mean, I, there's exceptions to every rule, but I mean, I'd say most of the stuff we're, we're looking at some stuff in Florida and we're looking at some stuff in, in DFW. Those are kind of the first couple of markets. They're definitely looking other places, but those are kind of on the forefront. I mean, most of those are just, you know, cross dock, shallow bay type stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say, I'd say on average, it's probably three to 400 square feet, um, is, is on average, but you know, one of the deals in Dallas is 300 square feet and the other one's 750,000 square feet. Yeah. I mean, when we started, what's amazing to me about the industrial is when we, when we started it, um, we were, and I still think we are, we're trying to play in a different sandbox than what I'll call the, the big hitters. I mean, the, you know, we, we can't go to toe to toe with the pro lodges. I mean, we can't go toe to toe with some of these bigger shops that have, you know, tenants that, that follow them around. But 
there's just a lot of areas that the big shops just don't want to play in or, or maybe they don't know about because, you know, they're focused on the, the main and main. And so, you know, luckily we stumbled onto what I think are pretty good couple of sites in the, in the Metro here and a couple of sites in Florida. And they're probably bigger than we thought they would be, but we feel like we're still kind of our own little sandbox. And, and, you know, so that's just kind of how it's evolved. Is there any crossover in data of how the data you get off of an industrial deal could help you in multi or the data you're getting off of multi might help you have an insight on industrial or are they pretty siloed? Generally, I'd say they're pretty siloed. I mean, in, in, in the short term, I mean, I've definitely learned a lot about concrete and steel and inflation more on the industrial than I have on the apartments. And then I think how they're not siloed is, I mean, we've got, we've got a couple of projects where we're actually building an industrial building right next to an apartment deal. Yeah. And so it was just the perfect storm where the industrial buyer, it was, it was a little bit too much land. The apartment buyer it was a little bit too much land. The landowner wasn't willing to break it apart. And we just got fortunate enough to find out about it and said, well, we'll, we'll buy all the land. And, you know, I mean, the, the great thing about a more affordable um, apartment is if you just give me a, an affordable rent, I don't, I don't mind being right next to an industrial building. Right. And then a lot of times if you're have some rental in, in an industrial area, you know, you don't have a lot of zoning opposition. Right. So the, the two actually work pretty well together. We've actually got one project. Um, that we're going to close on the land. We're going to build senior SFR attainable and industrial as one mixed use community. I wish that was my deal, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just interesting how, so, um, how they, if you get lucky, they can, what, what I've enjoyed most about Greystar, I guess, is we all go through different cycles and it's, it's been nice to the only arrow I used to be able to work with is conventional apartments. And then we started working on senior and we started doing student and now we're looking at SFR in the future. And now we're looking at industrial. So as, as just a pure developer, you know, you've always got a product type, not only to work with in, I mean, maybe the senior is not the right time to build, or maybe the industrial is not the right time, but the conventional are or vice versa. And, and then you also, um, I mean, listen, Graystar is going to work on bigger deals in Fort Capital. Yeah. But it's also nice. Um, you know, if you find a hundred acre track of land, you know, 10 years ago, I and it's like, what am I going to do with a hundred acres? Yeah. But, you know, man, if you find one in the right spot and you can build SFR and you could build senior and you could build. So you, you have some more kind of arrows in the quiver. So it's been really interesting to work on some bigger deals. But at the same time, they're parceled off and can be can be smaller deals, too, from from an exit strategy standpoint. All right. Speaking kind of more just like general, the next few questions. Uh, Texas has has been hot for a long time. It's really hot right now. Um, you get to obviously talk to your peers in other regions of the country. You sit on uh, whenever y'all are presenting deals at investment committee. You can hear what's going on around in the country as it relates to like Texas position to other areas. I know Florida's hot. You mentioned Florida. Are there any? areas that are doing better? Is there anything that kind of stands out as far as how is Texas is performing uh, versus the rest of the country? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the Southeast, um, in Texas are performing similarly. I mean, the Southeast is in the Carolinas are, are, are very, very hot. Um, I think, um, I think the West coast has probably been, um, hurt during the pandemic more than the, the Texas and the Southeast markets. I mean, you, you, you really in, in Texas and the Southeast, I don't think you've really seen rent declines. Um, mm -hmm. you have in, in, in some of the higher priced, um, you know, coastal markets. So, I mean, I think the kind of smile states and are, have, have kind of performed well and the higher priced, um, coastal markets have, you know, just given where their rents were and what, yeah. and what happened have, have definitely seen a, a pullback, but, that's not uncommon. And then, you know, once we work our way through this, those, those will probably recover pretty, pretty,
pretty significantly like they always do. And, but I, I think the coastal has been hurt more than the Sun Belt. How long does it take to get a deal done in California versus a deal <laughs> done in Texas? A, lo- a lot longer. Like five or six years, right? Probably. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in California, you know, in addition to zoning, you have to go through a, a, a whole coastal uh, sequel. You've got to go through a whole environmental process. Um, yeah, it, it takes. So Austin, Austin in, in, in Texas is probably the hardest to develop. And then probably followed by Dallas and then, you know, followed by Houston. Houston doesn't have zoning, but it, you know, it does have a lot of deed restrictions, but, um, Austin's really, really hard compared to Dallas and it's nothing compared to California. So, I mean, I, I definitely sit on investment committee and the California deals definitely take a while. Didn't have this question, but it just came to mind. Um, and I know you haven't done a bunch of deals out in California, but when you're capitalizing something that you realistically know from like the time I give you the first, you know, model and deck, it could be six years until it's open. How do you underwrite something that knowingly won't open for six years? Well, there's definitely a lot of questions around that with 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 capital. Some capital can get comfortable with it, some can't. But in all cases, you're you're building in cost escalation. So you may be escalating hard cost at three to five percent, but you're also going to be escalating rents. Right. So you're you're building in escalation factors, but on your longer lead time markets from a development risk standpoint, I mean, you're definitely, you're getting paid to take risk for the easiest thing to predict is the short term, the longer term is more difficult, but that's also why in, in some of the more um, longer lead time markets, um, you can do really, really, really well. Yeah. You, you can, you can make more money than you can on, on kind of more of the trading markets, but it's at the expense of, you know, more risk. Is there a metric or a couple metrics that matter to you, no matter what type of deal you're underwriting? I mean, I think the most important metric is, is, is probably what I've defined as untrended yield. Okay. I mean, cause What's that? Um, we find a track of land, we're going to build an apartment. We kind of know what, what it costs to build it today. And we, we know where it's really easy to figure out what it costs to build today. It's really easy to figure out what rents are today. And so I think that that you, that's really the investor's current yield going into a deal. And so, you know, obviously, you know, if you're talking about building an apartment in Dallas and you're going in yields of four, that's pretty scary given all the risk you have. I mean, you may be wrong about your rent. So I think that anything you, that's easy to have insight into in the short term. I, I, I find that more important than, you know, what, what are rents going to be 10 years from now or what cap rates going to be 10 years. I mean, because as an investor, you don't have to sell the project. You know, you hope that you have a current yield of X going in and you hope it's generally going to grow with inflation. And then, you know, the optimal time to sell is when, you know, when the cap rate is well below that. Right. Um, there's times when it's above that and you just have to kind of, so the only thing you have for sure is that current yield. So that, that would probably be, um, you know, outside location and going in basis and all that. It's probably what's my realistic current yield. And do I think I'm getting paid for the risk I'm about to take in case all my future assumptions that go out 10 years are totally wrong. And then the trended yield is just assuming kind of when it stabilizes. Yeah. And those are a little bit of guesses since it's going to happen someday. It's later all, in the it's all, it's all based on rent growth, right? Have the spreads between what you're building to and what you're exiting on, like total basis points change or it just. Yeah, they probably narrowed a little bit. I mean, so generally for the past several years to have a deal financed, you needed to be on average, I would say you're your going in yield, your untrended yield needed to be about 175 basis points above spot caps. So, you know, when spot caps were four and a half, if you were going to build a suburban deal, you, you needed to be six and a quarter, six and a half. Well, now spots have dropped pretty much sub four everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so what, what developers and capital partners have to decide is, okay, am I going to call spot three and a half and expand 
my exit caps 50 or 75 basis points? Or do I think the sub four may be a short term thing and maybe I need to kind of put some type of floor on it? So I think the, I think instead of that 175 basis point spread, it's probably narrowed to 150. Mm -hmm. But the going in yields have dramatically, just as we all try to absorb significant cost increases in our budget and still maintain a attainable level of rent, yields have come in, but so have cap rates. And so, you know, like I said, I mean, I mean, the deal right around the corner that, that land I bought from you, Elon River District. I mean, when we did that deal, I think our untrended yield was a seven. That deal today would be a sub six. Wow. And that's mainly because of just cost increases and land increases. Land always goes up, right? <laughs> According to you landowners, it does. Um, if you can speak to this, if you're underwriting a merchant development deal, we're going to build it, we're going to lease it, and we're going to sell it. Typical structure is like a pref with a split that's some type of waterfall based on IRR hurdles met. If you're doing like a build decor where the 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 idea is to hold it, and there might not be any way to necessarily just recap all the equity out and kind of get into the promote. How are those deals structured for like a 10 year hold on the GP side? I'm not sure how much detail I can yeah. really get into, but just from a macro level, um, you know, if you're aligning yourself with capital to be there for 10 years versus say three to four, I would say the, the, um, the, the waterfall is similar. Um, and then at, at some point there's a mechanism to, to probably, you know, move the developer out of the way, pay them a little bit of a, of a bonus and, and, and they kind of, they kind of go away. Um, you know, there's, there's been other cases where, um, you know, there's maybe more of an option or, or, or put type of deal. So there's a way to do it. Um, you know, c clearly, um, clearly it's different, but, um, be hard for me to get in too much specifics yeah. on it, but. Um, I think from a, from a, from a developer standpoint, um, you know, if they deliver the product, they said they were going to deliver and at least up and you're, you know, you're generally on your, your underwriting, um, you know, we, we kind of try to negotiate a, uh, you know, some type of bonus mechanism in there. And, and then, you know, we step to the side and, um, you know, it kind of goes into more of an investment phase. This was more of a four or five year ago when it was all the conversation, but opportunity zones. Have you done any deals in them? If not like countrywide, have they kind of proved out to be what we thought they were this great thing? Uh, yes, we have done some, we we've got, we've probably done, we've probably done two or three and I've heard discussions of another two or three, but I yeah. mean, it's been, I don't, I think it's probably too early to rate probably um like what we were talking about earlier on maybe why there's not more capital on the senior yeah um there's definitely a lot of interest in the space but um I, we haven't round trip to uh, an oz deal yet so it's probably still probably too early to rate. i mean i think the, the fundamental principle is um the deals we've done have been good deals even if they weren't in the opportunity zone with the tax benefit and so there's still I think the laws on that stuff is still being written. And so there's still a little, you, you could talk to three OZ investors and each of them interpret the law and what they can and can't do a little bit differently. And so I don't know if that's yeah flushed itself out or not, but I think the the way these OD, OZ deals have worked for us is they're really, really good, whether they're in the, in the OZ or not. And if the OZ turns out to be what a lot of people think it is, then it, it it's just going to be, um, it's going to be upside on the deal or, it'll be a mechanism to maybe move it into a longer term core of capital that is really who's going to get the benefit from the, from the tax advantage. All right. Just a little bit on property management. I think y'all are the largest in the country. I think I read y'all manage two or 3% of the units in the entire country. I don't know what it is on a percentage. I think we manage approximately 750,000 units. Okay. What comes to mind when I say like, what are the, what advantages does Graystar have managing 750,000 units besides, you know, consistent cash flow and, and like from a corporate level, I get it. But like, 
from a data perspective or how you treat people or just things that you can do differently because of your size and scale? Is there is there advantages that you have? I mean, I think the main advantage is is uh, just economies of scale on yeah. on on cost. Just you know, bulk buying power. Yeah. Um. Again, we don't we don't own all those units. I mean, we we manage. I mean, two thirds of those units are probably other owners, and right. so you know, all their information is private, all of it's, um, you know, confidential. So there's only so much you can do, but one thing we can do is, I mean, you know, we can try to buy the same granite, you know, we can try to buy the same appliances. We can, you know, all the properties are using waste management. We So we can try to have some economies of scale. And then we can also try to have some economies of scale from a, from an operating efficiency standpoint. Um, you know, we've got, I don't know how many we have in Dallas, 120, you know, property. So, um, you know, compared to just having one, we can probably generate some economies of scale on, on, on maintenance and, and, you know, other payroll things that, that can be passed on to the benefit of the, you know, the ultra owner. So I think, I think the biggest thing is just probably scale and we're, we're pretty, we talked about technology earlier. I mean, I think we're pretty, you know, our scale gives us, um, a lot of access to, new technologies and how to think about them, how how to present those to the different owners. But I think it's just probably operational efficiency and and trying to use the size to, you know, pass those savings on down and operate each property, you know, as as cost effective as you can while delivering the level of service that that particular project or owner envisions for their customers. When you had mentioned like the, the personless tours, is that essentially kind of eliminating one of the people on staff and you're now purely doing that? And that's a, that's a huge kind of line item or is that person just being used elsewhere now? Yeah. You know, there's, there, again, there's, there's a lot of things to, to, to pick out of there in terms of, um, you're trying to balance that you have existing customers you're taking about. So you, but, you know, I go back 10 years ago and I would occasionally stumble into another owner's project, a lot of times it was, it was one of the bigger REITs. And I was just like, man, I, I can't, I can't believe they're going to let me go on a self tour. And maybe they were just 10 years ahead of, of what we've all been through. But, you know, I think now it's just, um, you'd be, you'd be shocked at how many people will lease an apartment unit without even going to the project. They yeah. just do it virtually. And you have to come up with some incentives on figuring out a way to, to get the customer to do that. Um, you know, maybe it's some type of return policy. Hey, you can lease online. And as long as you come and look at the unit within X amount of hours, if you really decide you don't want it, then fine. So you just have to, you have to figure out some incentives. Um, you know, it's like the senior side. I mean, the senior, those projects lease up in four to six units a month. And, you know, if your average conventional user visits the project one and a half times before they make a lease decision, that demographic may visit it 15 times. Yeah. And so somebody came up with this idea. Well, what if we just created a guest suite? Well, what if we just had a model unit on site where we said, Hey, why don't you come try us before you buy it? Just so you started having people spend the night there over the weekend and they're like, man, I, now I know what this is going to be like. I'm not, I'm not scared to go sell my home. Yeah. And so I think on the conventional side, um, you know, what, what I heard, you know, a, a wise man at, at Graystar once say was, you know, we, if you're not careful, you'll be Kodak. And, you know, I was at a conference one time when he said this and I looked around and everybody under the age of 25 was like, who's Kodak, you know? And so in, in this business, whether it's operations, whether it's driving cost savings, it's all technology based, but you're having to weave that changing experience with a lot of people that still live in apartments that aren't accustomed to that. And how do you, how do you weave the two together? But, um, yeah, I mean, I think you'll, you'll see a lot more online leasing happen. And I think you'll see a lot more, um, people feel more comfortable on their own schedule coming out there and, Hey, here's my driver's license. Do you mind if I go tour my unit real quick and I'll be right back and they don't have, they don't want to wait 20 minutes if, Hey, I'll be back at two o'clock signs on the yeah. office or what? So I think it's, I think it's a benefit, you know, for everybody. 
you have to balance that with, okay, I can't have a bunch of people just aimlessly roaming around my property because I still have an existing set of customers that, that aren't going to like that. And so you, over these past 18 months, it's just been, how do you come up with a set of guidelines and rules that everybody can follow? And, and it kind of works for everybody. That's, that's what's been the hardest. All right. Multi's good. Everything's pretty good right now. Capitals everywhere. Um, you know, interest rates are low, but you know, costs are going up. Is there any, and maybe we can relate it to just kind of the Texas market, or you can give more of a broader statement. Like, is there anything that keeps you up right now? Like what are the big risks out in the market right now that if there were any? I mean, I think you always have to say supply. Yeah. I mean, you, you nailed it earlier, right? I mean, Dallas has lead, been leading the country for several straight years of supply and um, usually that doesn't end well, but a lot of people continue to move here. Um, a lot of jobs continue to be created. All the supply continues to lease up at healthy paces and, and healthy rents, albeit maybe not as is in line with some um, optimistic underwrites, but generally it continues to stay healthy. But supply always keeps me up. Cost, cost continue to keep me up. I mean, it. We we tend to we tend to continue. We carry more contingency at our first underwriting on the hard cost than. I've ever carried in my career and man, it's the flip of a coin by the time you get nine months later, if, if you carried enough. Yep. Um, so costs are always there. And then the last one is just, um, when I'm trying to balance that cost issue and all these other issues, can I keep my rents at a, at a price that's reasonable? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's easy to go build in a, an apartment in Frisco. If you can, if you're willing to underwrite, Seventeen, eighteen hundred dollar rent. Yeah, it's another question of if the customer can pay it. Yep. On that supply, and maybe it's something that I noticed doing a lot of kind of urban development years ago, and doing a lot more entitlement work where you need a lot of neighbors um, to agree. Has from like when you started? Because even when I started, this wasn't a case. But now they have the the next door app, and they have Facebook groups. It seems like the developer is like the maybe they were always the, the quote unquote villain, but now it's like as soon as something is even mentioned, it goes into this chat room. You know, by the second day, they're already making up rumors that you know you're going to displace so and so. And is the has it be? And it goes to supply. It's harder to get a projects approved that need entitlements. Like, have you guys seen that? That the rise of like you know social media and things online have just made no question. Yeah. No question. Is there like any silver we're, we're, bullet to solve it besides some federal mandate that time, time and patience? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll say this compared to three or four years ago when we're looking for sites, we're, we're definitely, we're, we're definitely very aware of, you know, who are the stakeholders that are around us and can we imagine if they're going to like or not like this product. And generally speaking, um, if we think it's going to be an uphill battle, um, and we're probably just going to move on to, to a different site. Now, you know, listen, if, if we really like the site and really like the location, um, and we just think it's a really, really good opportunity, we're going to be willing to roll our sleeves up and, you know, go to a lot of neighborhood meetings and try to build a consensus. Um, and at some point, if we can't do it, um, you know, we'll, we'll either move on or we'll, we'll carry the deal forward to council and, and, and see what happens. I mean, yeah. you know, <clears throat> I think sometimes I look back in my career and we built some projects and maybe I say, you know what, maybe, maybe the stakeholder was, was right. Maybe, maybe some of their concerns were justified, but I've had a lot of cases where it wasn't, we built it their property value skyrocketed. And, and so, um, as busy as we are and as busy as everybody is, nobody wants to, nobody wants to get, I've had two four year zoning cases in Dallas yeah. and, um, I don't, I don't know that I would sign up for another four year zoning case. Um, so w what we try to do is we try to really pick the site. Well, we try to get out, 
very quick. We try to start meeting with the neighbors. We try to start meeting with the city. And, you know, if, if after three or four or five months, it seems like, man, this is just going to be an uphill battle, not yeah. down drag out. But I'll say this. I mean, in today's time, you get most of the time you'll get a pretty quick read from a city on, on how hard is this going to be or, or not be. And, and there's been many cases where, um, the city shut us down because of some, some negative opposition. There's been times where there's been opposition, but just, you know, maybe there was a lot more, you know, I always call it, you know, most people that show up at a council meeting are, are against the project. I mean, you know, if somebody's building an apartment around the corner for me and I don't have a problem with it, why am I going to take my time and go all the way to city council and tell them how great it is? But rest assured, if I don't want it, I'm going to make time to go there. So, you know, um, but generally speaking, um, yes, everything you said is right. I mean, the, the stakeholders that are in opposition are, they're, they're very well organized. I mean, they're organized on all these social media apps and, um, you know, sometimes you don't even know what's going on or you'll, you'll go to a meeting and think you had a great meeting. And three months later, it's like, man, they, they've been mad the whole time. And how did I not know that? So it's, it's definitely different than it was 10, 15 years ago. Well, and just like in the, at the meetings at the city, there's always the provocator in the chat room that's, you know, getting everybody riled up. All right, one more, and then you've been gracious with your time. I'm off the hot seat. I've noticed that Graystar has started raising capital on Crowd Street and a couple of the major crowdfunding sites, and for that matter, a lot of other big institutional groups. Is that the the future? Um, are y'all just kind of dabbling in it to see how it works? Um, I know we've been thinking about you know, more of it. I've talked to a lot of people. It seems like we've kind of been through the cycle of it becoming a thing and people getting used to it. But when I saw Graystar on there, it was, um, I was pretty shocked. Yeah. You, you may know Graystar better than I do. I mean, I can only think of one deal that we've closed and gone through kind of a crowdsourcing deal. Maybe there are two, but yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think, I think it's probably, trying to understand it better and understand, you know, could that be a part of, of our, of our capital sourcing going forward? But listen, for, for the next several years, um, I mean, we've got a very stable group of investors that have done a lot of deals with us and we want to continue to do deals with them. Um, you know, are we going to do some build to core stuff? Sure. Um, could there be a crowd sourcing deal here or there? Sure. But I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be, you know, the bulk of our capital sourcing for apartments. But I can't, I can't say that there won't be a handful here or there for whatever reason. There there was, there were some reasons on those deals why, why that road was pursued. Um, It certainly, it certainly, it's certainly been more of a demand and more of an equity strategy than I think any of us would have thought a couple of years ago. Yeah. All right. Thank you as always. This was awesome. Meantime. There's a lot of brokers in DFW and all over that listen. If you have a site, call Laird or call me first and then I'll call Laird. So you can mark the land price. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, thanks, dude. All right. Appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Still can't believe you got your own podcast. This is it. This is all I do now. Hey everyone, it's Chris here again. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star rating or write a quick review. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next episode. Chris Powers is the founder and CEO of Fort Capital LP. All opinions from Chris and guests of the Fort Podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Fort Capital LP. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for real estate or investment decisions. The Fort with Chris Powers is produced by Straight Up Podcasts.